Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul series in Kerbal Space Program 1.0.5. I decided that the reason we might have been getting the shaking on the launch pad recently since I upgraded to 1.0.5 is because I was opening craft that were built in 1.0.4. I know there shouldn't be any reason for that to happen, but I suspect that there was. And it is based on uh, the fact that when I opened craft built in Kerbal, with Kerbal Joint Reinforcement in a install without Kerbal Joint Reinforcement, I've had that similar shaking, so maybe the fact that Kerbal Joint Reinforcement had some change between the two versions might cause that as well. Now it's just a hypothesis, which we are going to check. And we're going to check that by building a completely new rocket for a completely new mission this time. So probably the Paris 1 and Pluto 1C, I'm just going to scrap these. I'll leave them on the list and just move up the next rocket, so they'll continue building just in case we can uh, get them for spare parts kind of thing. Uh, we've got quite a lot of these hanging out as it is, but anyway, let's take a look at at uh, our possible missions to see what we should pick up. Probably the Mars one is the best idea. Let me add an alarm uh, for a transfer window to Mars. That's in one year and three days, so we should be able to get done with something before that. So yeah, let's take a look. Okay. Do a low-resolution scan of the moon. Uh, radar scan of the moon. Looks like a specific scientific instrument would be necessary for that. There's a penalty for declining, too. Hmm. Human orbital. Below 332 kilometers above 170. Okay, it looks like we have to spend a day and a half up there. I guess that's what that means. At least one Kerbal. We could probably do that just fine, can't we? It's not worth that much, though. And maybe I sh Well, I don't know. I don't know if I need more science. I probably need more funds to unlock the... The research building. Mm -hmm. The next level of the research building. So we're looking for serious funds. And I don't want to do another crude mission. I've been doing too much of that recently. It was just positioning a satellite... Oh, in orbit around Mars. Hmm... That might be trickier, but uh, that'll wait for the Mars. Let's uh, find something that won't require the Mars uh, window. I want to land on the moon. Uncrewed moon landing. Wow, the advance and completion are worth less than the failure. That's not nice. It's not nice at all. Okay, well, um, I think this is what I wanted to do. Maybe we can combine it with the low resolution scan of the moon. That at least has a very nice completion rate and relatively low failure. So yeah, radar scan of the moon and uncrewed moon landing. Don't know exactly what that entails, the, the radar scan in particular. Let's go to VAB and see what I can cook up. Alright, so what we have here is a rocket, and I'll get to the payload in a second, but I wanted to make a few points uh, based on some of the stuff we've unlocked. And I've got two NK-15s here, I like these engines quite a lot, very useful engines, but there is a sort of pricing issue that I'd like to address, it might be controversial, I don't know. But taking a look at these NK-15s with their 1.24 ton mass their uh, 318 vacuum ISP and their 1,500-ish kilonewton vacuum thrust and the cost of 670. Then we take a look at the RS-27, which is the later variant, developed uh, later than the NK-15, I believe, uh, or, you know, I mean, certainly operational for a long time. And looking at the RS-27 variant, it's 1,023 kilonewtons, 295 seconds of ISP, and the total cost is 1,800 because it's 1,000 base cost and then 800 extra cost to unlock that technology. So the question sort of becomes, why would you ever use the RS-27? And I understand what they've been trying to do here. They're trying to match the real costs of these engines as well as they can. The problem with that is that obviously these engines were built by two very different space agencies and very different economic systems paying engineers very different amounts of money. And that's why they both exist. 
if you had the NK-15 and, and you were a single space agency, there would be no reason for you to develop the RS-27 per se. Um, yeah, or at least your RS-27 would end up a lot better and a lot cheaper than it is. I mean, you would expect that your RS-27 would cost maybe 600-ish funds, not 1,800. So, so that's that's an interesting little problem because in trying to match the real prices of these engines, uh, we get into a situation where it's not really reflecting the reality of the situation if everything was being used by a single space agency. So that's a bit of a problem. Uh, these engines, I mean, the, when the NK-15 was developed and the RS-27 was developed, uh, it was not possible for one agency to access the technology of the other. Obviously, eventually, we were able to use NK-33s in America on the Antares launch vehicle, but that was much later. So that is a thought. And another point is the RD-270M. Uh, I, now, I haven't unlo unlocked this, so I don't know what its pricing is. Hopefully, it's as ridiculous a price as the LR-87 LH2, 6500 uh, which would at least make it, you know, experimental and therefore highly costly. But that is a very peculiar engine that, yeah, I don't know what to make of that. Pentaborane, uh, yeah, I'm sure uh, I'll never use it because it's bordering on cheaty, frankly. Though maybe it is so expensive that it's, I mean, and the unlock cost is so high that it balances out. Okay, so the second stage engine here is an LR-105. I decided not to go with the LR-87 because of the high cost, also because of the service module tanks we would have to use to contain the hydrogen and them being so much heavier than the default tanks made it, uh, well, not very attractive altogether. And this does just fine. So uh, in terms of mass, Overall mass, I don't know exactly how it would balance out, but in terms of cost, this is certainly better. Just that engine alone would cost, you know, a fair chunk of the cost of this rocket. Okay, and then we have an RL-10 on the stage after that, which does have the service module tanks, and the service, at least those service module tanks are smaller physically. The business end of this is right here. And uh, here is the transfer stage with an asterisk engine. And it will also get us into orbit around the moon, hopefully. Um, we've got tiny little uh, tanks here with hydrazine for the RCS thrusters. We've got, so this portion will have the radar altimetry sensor. And I hope that that's what we need for the low resolution altimetry scan of the moon. 75, I suppose we have to scan 75% of the surface. So we should get into a polar orbit, just to make sure of that. We've got a high gain antenna here, and that should be able to definitely reach Earth from the moon. And we've got Commutron 32s on the bottom, and much solar panels. Then this is the lander portion. Uh, here we have two of these little probe cores, and this will start off the descent. And it has about 939 meters per second to work with. And then the to top portion, uh, just has these little attitude control jets because I'm trying to be sparse with it and you notice I tucked in the one kilonewton thruster a bit I hope that doesn't cause any problems it's burning hydrazine this is a hydrazine tank and this hydrazine inside here I've locked the electric charge here and it'll, it'll just be on internal power all this will be on internal power no solar panels nothing like that and then it will communicate with that antenna obviously and have all these instruments. All we really need is telemetry and the telemetry will be recorded by the Ranger Block 1 core itself. At least uh, it does say here that has uh, telemetry experiment. There we go, analyze telemetry. Alright, so that's that's all the details. Avionics is okay. I'm hoping that, the, obviously, this is a very cute little thing. Very, very sparse on the mass. It's not even got any landing struts. It's going to land on this structure here, and possibly the engine as well. So, yeah. Uh, 
every possible effort to save funds here. This is meant to be a cheap lunar lander mission. And I think 16,000 funds, that's uh, qualifying on that. And of course, uh, the NK-15s were unavoidable if we wanted to go cheap because they're like really, really cheap, right? 670 funds, um, you know, no engine with even half the thrust has that kind of pricing. Yeah, I mean, if you want 700 thrust, I guess you could go for these, but then this has like double the thrust of the RD-107-108. Yeah, I, I, honestly, I think the NK-15-33 might need to be priced a little bit higher. Uh, <laughs> it's because this comes from the same space agency. And, uh, yeah. You would wonder why they would continue using... Well, of course, the Soyuz system was what it was, but... You'd, you'd wonder why they would continue using these two when you have that one. Okay, I'm just gonna build one. And out here, I'm gonna move it to the top, whoop, top of the list. Okay, so 58 days, that's fine. We're gonna complete a new technology flight control in that time. Let me see, uh, we can upgrade the R&D building. I think 400,000 is fair. Let's upgrade that. And maybe we should spend some science points now that we have them. Faci oh, facilities, oh right, right. I, I had already started upgrading it. It's just gonna take a lot of time. Well, it's only gonna take 93 days more. Okay, that's not too bad. Oh, I should add the alarms for the other contracts here. Um, we... I only want the contracts I actually have. Um, hmm. Oh, okay, here we go. Do a low-resolution scan of the moon, uncrewed... Okay, I'll add them one at a time. Auto-create active alarms, all contracts. Okay, so it just wasn't set up like that. All right. Or to complete the Paris 1, which we will probably scrap, especially if it turns out that rockets built in this version with all these mods updated are stable on the launch pad, while the Paris 1 and Pluto 1C probably won't be. If it turns out that the Helicon 1 wiggles on the launch pad, then, then I might have to figure out something else. Okay, there we go. Let's roll it out. Oh, oh, we had shaking. We still have shaking. Uh, so the problem isn't fixed yet. It, it's not, it didn't happen as bad as it did with the larger rocket. This is obviously about three times, maybe four times small, no, about three times smaller than the Paris 1. So it didn't jostle quite as much, but it still did have the high G-forces. So. No, uh, replacing Kerbal Joint Reinforcement and having a brand new rocket in here has not solved the problem. Well, at least we aren't tilted, but it doesn't look like the taller rockets will have an easy time of it. So we're launching at night, obviously. Um, ambient light adjustment, maybe you can turn up just a little bit. Okay. Well, let's see if these new engines work. Ignition. Gotta let them spool up a bit. And launch. Alright, up it goes. Strongly doubt uh, test flight is configured for the NK-15s. Now, uh, yeah, only the RL-10 is properly configured right now. Now, as I understand it, uh, they have been fixing test flight and making sure everything is configured properly in the latest version of test flight RP0 and all that. If I do get the launch pad issue fixed, I'll upgrade to all those other things. Maybe I should just upgrade and see if that fixes it. But, you know, everything is liable to introduce new bugs. And I'd like to squish one bug before starting on some new ones. It looks like we have the fairings separating on the ignition of that engine. I don't need that. Don't know when exactly it'd be safe to separate the fairings. We'll, we'll say that it's during the second stage somewhere. 
Looks like we're past the speed of sound and everything is looking good still. Very, very simple rocket. Nothing too fancy going on here. Well, there's so far been very much a no drama sort of stage, which is good. Okay, getting ready for set. Throttle up, separation. Uh oh. Let's try it again, separation. And ignition. Alright, ignition is good on the LR-105. And let's see if we can separate the fairings without things going bad. Our apoapsis is really high right now. Ooh, we got a little bit of a kick there. Hmm. I've really let the apoapsis get out of hand. The first stage made me very sleepy for some reason. It's a very calm stage, it wasn't doing anything, and I think it uh, lulled me into a false sense of security kind of thing. Alright, separating the fairings. Alright, they are off. Extending antennae. Uh, those guys are sort of clipping into the fairing there. The margins on this mission are pretty tight. Our priority will be to do the radar scan first and then worry about the landing as a secondary mission. And that's simply because the contract for the low resolution scan only has 148 days whereas the uncrewed moon landing has much more time. Alright, getting ready for stage separation. Stage set, and ignition. Alright, the ignition on the RL-10 is good. And we continue. Um, it looks like we're, well actually we're pretty high, so it's a little bit hard for me to tell since we're higher than normal whether we have enough for orbit. It does look like I probably didn't need any hydrazine or RCS thrusters on this stage because it'll be totally spent. Yeah, I don't think uh, we'll be able to use any of it to get ourselves started on our way to the moon, but we'll see. Let's get solar panels out now. Okay, getting close to orbit now. 24 seconds left of burn time. Let's see if it can make it there. It looks like it's just about right. A better trajectory would have given us some extra fuel in this stage, which could have been beneficial because it can restart. But this is alright. Okay, shut down. Let's just stage that off. Separation. Okay, we are free. This tank is unlocked. We've got the little RCS tanks up there. Let's see if the RCS works fine. Oh, uh, hold on. Let's lock up the tops, top tanks so they don't get used. And actually the probe cores themselves also have tanks. So we can lock those too. Alright, so let's plot for the moon. Okay, well we don't need any sort of fancy free return trajectory, so we can just do this. And it's pretty cheap because thankfully we are burning out of our, well close to our periapsis anyway, in that area, rather than being on the wrong end of things. So we'll take advantage of our high apoapsis in this case. All right. So let's head over there. The stage time is eight minutes and 55 seconds. We don't need the whole stage. Probably we'll be burning eight minutes of that. Doesn't look like we're getting enough power, does it? 
Now, while we're time warping, uh, the upper cores will all go into low power mode, so that's a plus. But still, I'm, I'm surprised by the lack of power. I haven't even uh, tuned up this antenna. We probably don't need to, that high gain antenna right there. It's more to count counterbalance this altimetry sensor than anything else. I mean, it certainly said that we would have enough power in the VAB. I had that checked out. Uh, apparently something played a trick on me. Alright, here we go. Keeping an eye on that little part from this launch. Not too sure what it's doing out there. I mean, our solar panels are basically... Oh, maybe it's sunset? I don't know. Maybe that's reducing the amount of light we're getting. Gotta lock all the batteries on the upper section, just in case. They do go into... Oh, maybe that's not a good thing to do. Hmm. Yeah, I'll leave them be. Ooh, wow, ooh. Well, that was a close shave right there. Alright, we are getting close to the end of the burn. Our flame effect does not seem to work out for us when we're in time warp. But uh, getting out of time warp brings it back, so that's alright. And we have an approach, but we actually want to get into a polarish orbit, don't we? And we've been doing a very equatorial sort of thing. Let's see if we can fix that up a bit. I don't know, we might have to fix that in the Lunar SOI. Yeah, I'm gonna say that probably we'll have to wait until we get in there. It's not gonna work out for us otherwise. Okay. Yeah, once again, the numbers in the VAB on uh, Fuse Box fooled me. So I'm gonna try and lock this battery as well. Just conserve charge as much as possible. Okay, well we still have communication. Actually, I, I don't know if the fuse box is even reading stuff right, but anyway, I'm gonna unlock this battery. I think maybe our drain was actually a lot less than this made it seem. I think that was our drain, that what point oh one drain was actually happening. Maybe it wasn't lying in the VAB and it is lying here. That's that's a typical pattern. Then again, the opposite pattern also happens, so hence my confusion. Okay, so I want to try and tilt this into some sort of polar trajectory. Okay, we do have a signal delay now. 1.2 seconds. Alright, I'm gonna check on the fuel stability and then we'll start this burn. Very stable? Alright. Just looking for a good inclination and good periapsis and then I'll stop. Okay, well that's that's okay on both accounts. Alright, on to periapsis. Now it's really consuming battery, but that's because my solar panels aren't pointed at the sun at all. Indeed. Um, maybe we should fix that. Uh, maybe I should try this advanced thing. Sun... Forward. Does that seem forward at all to you when it comes to our relation to the sun? No, I think uh, this is why I've never trusted this before. Because I've had this sort of experience where it doesn't seem to understand forward, back, up, down, left, and right at all. And it uses such words. Seems quite meaningless to it. 
I always have to guess which one is which. Okay, well, up seems to work out. Won't take us very long to actually get into orbit here, so let's delay a bit. No connection? Aw, oh, crud. We are out of line of sight. We don't have any satellites around? Um, not for a while. Well, this is a bad plan on my part. Um, actually, seems like we should have connection, doesn't it? Are we out of range or something? Seems like we should have connection with a bunch of things. Oh, maybe it's just no power. Hold on. We finally lost all our power. So let me unlock this. Yes, now we have connection. All right. Feel settled? Very stable? All right. Crisis averted. Let's get the altimetry sensor started. Altitude is ideal. Doesn't look like we can analyze... Uh, well, we don't have much data to analyze yet. Let's see if that works out for us. I don't know. It might take a while. Oh, uh, there's a uh, 1%. Okay. So, it'll take a while. Hmm. On its own, this should have enough power. Uh, actually, it doesn't have an extra battery. Hmm. I forgot about that. All the batteries are up here. They're in a pretty high orbit, but it should work for the altimetry scanning? I don't know. Gotta let the RCS bring us down a bit. No, I think we might have to send a dedicated altimetry scanner at this rate. I just forgot to put enough power on this, looks like. Well, let me stop at 800 kilometers, because that's all I want to do. I'm running out of fuel there. Okay, let's see how much we can scan. I still got the battery on the top probe, so... Oh, it hasn't gone past 1%. 3%, okay. Okay, now we're close to our apoapsis. What does it say about how it likes the height? Too high. Figures. So, it's a noble effort, but I don't think this will work out. Gotta try the lander mission instead. Okay, um, is this a good place to... Looks like we'll be in communication wherever we happen to be. So yeah, um, given that, uh, might be a tight one. There might be a horizon problem if we land in certain locations, but let's just go for a pragmatic landing, see where we end up kind of thing, not target anything in particular, since it is an interestingly small system. Okay. All right, now on internal power, nine hours. Going to just unlock everything. No, uh, not that actually, just the uh, electric charge up here. All right. Let me verify that the RCS ports, hmm. The RCS ports are not working. Now I'm pretty sure I configured them to hydrazine. Well, that's gonna be tricky, isn't it? Um, or maybe, oh, I've got all the fuel locked. That's why. Right. 
Okay. Nope, that wasn't why. Maybe it doesn't feed through the decoupler. Nope, the RCS ports just don't like being on that structure. Oh, shucks. Well, that's not gonna do us any good. Unfortunately, one kill Newton thrusters do not have gimbling. Oh, wait, it worked. Oh, it just, they're, they're just so weak that I can't notice. Okay, they're working. It's just, you can't really see the puffs of whatever it is. All right, well, uh, retrograde, and let's prepare to land. Let's add some extra pitch to control the vertical speed a bit. We're gonna have a long trip down. Okay, we're in business. Oh, I take it back. I take it back. We seem to be deviating. We should have gone into a much lower orbit initially. This is gonna be a pretty bad descent profile. It's amazing how much lag I get even though there's so few parts. Sometimes I wonder whether it's remote tech and all the communication stuff that has to be calculated. Or something else that relates to how many craft I actually have flying rather than the part count on this one. Guess they've really turned down the sound on these one kill newton thrusters. They used to be pretty darn loud, didn't they? Suddenly with the realistic audio. Well, I mean obviously you wouldn't be able to hear anything at all anyway, but somehow the silence makes it much more tedious. We don't appear to have as much control as I would like right now. What's up? Suddenly the RCS isn't working? I mean, obviously we're deviating quite a lot. Here, uh, let me try and take care of it myself, maybe. We are definitely moving away from retrograde by quite a lot. I don't see the thrusters firing at all. Pretty sure the engine is centered. Everything should be balanced around the center. There's no asymmetric part. They were firing earlier. Oh. Huh. Okay, they respond to that. Um, that's weird. They don't respond to smart ASS at all, but they respond, respond to I, J, and K. Alright, I guess we can go with that. I don't know if SAS can use little thrusters or not. Apparently not. Okay, uh... This is gonna be a little bit hard to handle if neither Smart ASS nor SAS can use them. Alright, well there goes that stage. Let's just separate. and activate this engine well SAS seems to be trying to stabilize okay let me take SAS off temporarily that would be helpful if we were oriented right right now perhaps I should wait for the suicide burn or something close to it let me check surface info. 80 kilometers still. Definitely not a normal lunar descent here. I really wish Smart ASS would help out here. Any chance of that? Maybe? Oh no. Oh wait, maybe. Mm, no, 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 no. Oh, shucks. Oh, crud. Um, mm. 
Well, at least my joystick seems to be working now. That's nice. That'll make it a little bit easier than pressing I, J, K, and L. We've obviously used a lot of fuel on just maneuvering. Okay, only 15 seconds on the suicide burn countdown, so this should be good timing. Well, if you can make a smaller lunar lander than this, more power to you, but I don't think I can make anything smaller than this personally. This is probably the smallest lunar lander I will ever do. Certainly in realism overhaul with RP0 because you have to have a certain amount of probe core. Okay, let's hold off for a bit. But I don't think I've got enough time that I should time warp. I mean, the next time warp step is 10x. Yeah, I think I had a minute, so that's like 6 seconds. Too likely to cause problems. Oh, okay, that's not a good idea. That wasn't a good idea. I was trying to use the RCS to cancel out our horizontal velocity. Now there's no throttling on this, so we have to do it in bursts. Thankfully, uh, throttle is not affected by the signal delay. Neither is my maneuvering. And there we go. Oh no 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 RCS you can you can switch off now. Plop. Uh, a little bit of rocking motion, but SAS really has no control even though it's trying. And before we lose communication, we might be connecting through our uh, the other portion of our mission here. Let's analyze telemetry. Let's transmit that data. All right. 18 signs received, and more importantly, the contract is complete. Uncrewed moon landing. Very good. Um, There's just stage recovery telling me stuff and other basic information. Okay, but we have other signs that we could do. Uh, radiation data. Have we done this before? No, we haven't. Moon's lowlands. Transmit. Much science will be had this day. All right, transmit the temperature scan from the lowlands. Recording impact data. Transmitting that from the moon's surface, so we only get one of those. Which, I guess this is our first landing with a probe on the moon? Or we didn't carry that one on the previous one? I forget. Okay, I've, I mean, I've done this so many times. Not with something like this, though. This is the cutest little guy I've ever used. Okay, record perturbation data. Alright, gravity scan from the lowlands. Okay, there we go. Uh, mission partial success. The landing was done. The scanning was not. We got 12% so far of the scanning, but it's going to run out of power, I think. I wonder... Well, it'll be cheaty. Let, let's just assume that we're going to have to do it again. Uh, I'm saying it's cheaty because maybe if I'm not tuned to it it'll continue scanning the moon even though it runs out of power it, it won't detect that it ran out of power because the power isn't being checked in the background but I'm gonna assume that we have to send another thing over there uh, in orbit to do the scanning we'll see um, we'll probably want some other contract to pair with it though anyway but uh, that's it for this episode I think we got something done and i hope to do something somewhat different in the next episode all right so thank you for watching if you enjoyed this episode please do press like if you have any comments or suggestions please leave them in the comment section below and i'll see you next time